Hi, I'm Hanyu, and welcome to Market Tidbits with Daishi Consulting. Today, we have a very special guest, Miro Lee from Double V Consulting. Hello, everyone. This is Miro. I'm from Double V Consulting. Uh, we are a marketing consultancy company helping overseas brands to enter China market. So uh, thank you for coming. And today, our topic is going to be a healthy trend, the effect of increased nutritional awareness on China's food and beverage industry. So um, as we've all observed, and as you uh, can be seen in the report, there is a great surge in awareness for healthy eating habits in China. Mira, what's your take on this? Um, I think this is already a big trend even before the pandemic, pandemic because uh, when people have more disposable income, though, so they will naturally pay more attention to their own health conditions. And during the COVID, this is even more important because we are all educated like about our hygiene problems like we need to wash our hands several times every day we need to disinfect our room our clothes and we should not eat any um, undercooked food so that's why people start to realize the um the importance of the health and i think the easiest way to be healthier when we are you know staying at home from COVID is to eat healthier food and have a healthy eating habit. So that's why I think this is why uh, during, pandemic, during pandemic, people are paying more attention to their own health conditions and also the um, health eating habits. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, as you mentioned, um, I think the lockdown, people can't even leave their own homes. And uh, you know, most people in China, they prefer to exercise outside, especially uh, the seniors, they love going to parks and they love uh, the uh, the square dance, Guangchang Wu. And uh, without those venues to you know improve their health, they're looking to healthy eating as the main source of uh, providing themselves with a healthy lifestyle. And also, I think, um, yeah, as you mentioned, this was a trend before COVID. And I think uh, the younger generation has a lot to do with it. I think health awareness powered by social media and the internet um, the awareness among the younger generation is increasing at a very rapid pace. If you look, um, maybe do some social listening on different video platforms and uh, platforms such as Weibo, you can see that there are tons of posts by young people about eating healthy, living healthy, and exercising. Yeah, and um, there is also a, a very interesting term called Yangsheng, health awareness, which is like a unique lifestyle of the young people. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's like uh, they are worried about their own health conditions, but oh, but in the meantime, they also want to maintain their you no know, lifestyle, like go go clubbing, stay up late, um, drink Coca Cola. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and now we also we want to get into the more particular aspects of health in China. So, um, according to your understanding, what are some of the uh, concepts or even uh, or even ingredients that are you know highly related to health in China? Um, I think uh, one, one concept that I noticed um, has been rising recently is that zhuang shi tong yuan in Chinese. So in, in English, it's, uh, it means that the cosmetics and the food have same ingredients. So basically, we have seen some new food products. They have added the uh, ingredients that used to be in the cosmetics products. For example, you can see a, a collagen water, which is um, a water <laughs> added a collagen in it. And um, it's the product is also marketed as um, a product that when, when you drink this water, you can, you know, it will make your skin better or something like that. So this is a, a trend that I noticed. Uh, and also you, you can see some probiotics yogurt, which is um, the probiotics, is also an ingredient that's been added in the food and also in the cosmetics products. Um, and um, another trend is that people are really, really, you know, I think they are, they are, they are crazy about the low sugar or zero sugar or zero fat products. Like any product with this kind of label, uh, saying that they have no sugar, no fat will be super popular. And, uh, some products that we're also very familiar with, like uh, Genki Forest, the Yuan Qi Sen Lings, 
um, the, the sparkling water says that they have zero sugar, zero fat. So this kind of concepts are uh, very popular. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting, as you mentioned, uh, there is uh, collagen in drinks and uh, the concept of, you know, zero fat, zero sugar. So like the success of these brands actually depends on very much uh, what's trending and what's in the discourse rather than perhaps what's actually like very scientific. Um, so I think there's a lot, there's a lot in, uh, there's a lot of marketing towards perceptions in China. And of course, there are some areas um, where this might cause uh, some issues. For example, um, I think uh, we all know that milk is the uh, god of healthy drinks in China. Uh, as a kid, all the parents tell their, uh, all their kids to, uh, you know, you must drink uh, milk to grow taller. You must uh, drink milk to grow strong. And there's such a like, strong perception towards the healthy benefits of milk in China. And this is actually quite ironic because in the Chinese population, um, many, many people are lactose intolerant. So um, my question yeah. to you is like, how, how do these perceptions um, play into marketing uh, strategies? So um, how do you market off of Chinese uh, cultural perceptions of health? Yeah, this is, this is a very interesting um, question because like you said, many Chinese people don't really know what kind of um, uh, food or what kind of ingredients added in the food are good or bad to their own body. So when, when the brands are doing marketing, they usually would highlight the, the good part, of course. Like, um, uh, for example, we have seen some plant-based meat, which is a uh, super hot food now in China. So they will say that, okay, I have more uh, protein compared to the red meat. Um, but actually there is also, you know, the, the, the plant-based meat is not perfect either because mm -hmm. usually it will be more, uh, it, it's highly processed. It will contain more additives, more sodium. So they usually only highlight the good part and don't tell you the whole, the, the big picture. You, you don't know the, the bad part. So I think this is, Mm, uh, not really good for uh, food brands and uh, the Chinese customers, although they may have some misconceptions, but more and more uh, people start to realize, okay, this, mm, they, they start to have the right um, perception for uh, different food or different food ingredients. So uh, the, the, the customers are very smart. This is what I always tell many brands that they would know um, the hidden problem behind your marketing words. Uh, we've seen so many like um, complaints about their misleading marketing terms, you know, in, in their advertisements. Like uh, we see cases from Yankee Forest and most recently we see a case from um, a brand that sells the whole grain bread, which is called Tianyuan Zuyi. So they're also being pointing out that uh, what they claim the calories is around like 100, but it's not accurate. It should be like 30, 40% higher. So I think customers are being smarter and smarter and they start to, um, start to, you know, find your problems behind your advertisements. Mm. So yeah, that's actually a very, very interesting trend because uh, to my understanding, um, these marketing tactics or marketing towards misconceptions, they were actually somewhat helpful and like even quite useful in past decades but now as uh, during the turn of the century because of uh, increase in social media and increase in internet these trends are becoming uh, these marketing tactics are becoming less and less effective because of the connectivity between customers yeah yeah that's true in the past people don't really read the ingredient label like how many uh, how many calories do you have like how, how many uh, sugar do you contain? In the past, people don't really know about that. But now the young people, especially the young people, they're paying a lot of attention. Like they would read word by word uh, your ingredients label and they will question you. Okay, but do you do you say you have 100 calories? Is this true? I have, they, they, some of them may even do some tests, you know, find some lab and do some lab tests and question you. So I think um, for brands, they, they should be more careful. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I just want to talk about an interesting case, uh, Genki Forest. I think it's probably one of the most successful uh, beverages in China right now. So um, 
Uh, what, are, what do you think are some of the best tactics that they've employed to push their product on such a wide scale? Um, I think um, one interesting thing about Genki Forest is that um, it sells the uh, flavored sparkling water and also the, the milk tea, which is usually, you know, which is usually considered as not so healthy drink mm -hmm. for many people. Yeah, but they use the terms like zero sugar, zero fat, zero calories. So w w when you when you when you drink it, it's like um, well, you, you will never gain any fat drinking our milk tea compared to other milk tea like Haiti's or other brands. So it makes you feel much more comfortable as a young girl because I I, I love milk tea, but I don't want to gain any fat. So so I think this is the most important tactic in their marketing. But it also leads to some, you know, problems. Like uh, they have a, they have a problem before that the zero sugar term is not really accurate because they have some kind of sugar, but they don't have um, tang, They don't have sucrose. This kind of sugar, yeah. but they have other kinds of sugar. So this is not really accurate. When you say you will never be fat drinking our drinking our sparkling water, you you will actually be fat. <laughs> so um, I think um, this zero sugar term is the key selling point, the most important selling point of the brand. But they also have some, you know, scandals because of this term. So um, this is also a lesson for you know other brands because after Genki Forest, a lot of other brands are also doing the same thing, uh, created some um, some drinks with labeled zero sugar, zero fat drinks. So yeah, this is another problem for them. Yeah, but uh, I do agree with you uh, in terms of uh, zero sugar marketing because uh, for you know any sweet beverage, claiming that you have zero sugar, it, it's a very big claim. And uh, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, because for you know for as long as we've known the main ingredient uh, in these soft drinks, like whether it's a Coca-Cola or Pepsi, it's been cane sugar. That uh, that's the ingredient for sweetness. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yes, they've removed that ingredient, but there are also alternative sweeteners that, um, well, I mean, you can't exactly call healthy. So yes, I do agree with you. Like uh, when saying zero sugar, that's a, a very, a quite risky marketing strategy. Um, but mm -hmm. I also wanted to, I also wanted to point out uh, something you said that um, they're kind of rebranding traditional drinks such as milk tea into something healthier. Because I think this is a lesson many brands should take in mind is because just because consumers want healthier products doesn't mean that they dislike unhealthy products. They want the same flavors. They want the same kind of drink, but just a healthier alternative. So a very good plan or a very good uh, product line for many companies, I feel, is uh, rebranding older products into a healthier package. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, uh, I think many brands are doing that because when they're highlighting the healthy part, like zero sugar, zero fat part, they also highlight their flavor. So for people, uh, they want to keep the same flavor because they love it. And in the meantime, if I don't need to be guilty drinking the milk tea, then I yeah. will be you know, more comfortable buying your products. So definitely, yeah, they, they, they can rebrand the, the traditional products to be more healthy. Yeah, same for me. Like uh, speaking from personal experience, I I do enjoy the occasional soft drink, and and I, when I get Coke or Coca Cola, um, mm -hmm. I always go for Coke Zero. I I know in my mind that you know it's of course it's not healthy, like it's a soft drink, but yeah. just because of that, you know, Coke Zero, it's just healthier the alternative. I still get it because you know, it just feels healthier, even though somehow I know it's not. So yeah, it's yeah. quite an interesting. It's quite an interesting marketing uh, strategy, and uh, so for our last segment, um, I wanted to briefly uh, talk about how older brands can adapt to these changing times. So as we know, some of the staple uh, brands of beverages in China, uh, for example, uh, Kang Shifu, uh, it it has mm -hmm. a long line, long list of products as Kang Chang Shifu Bing Hong Cha that people have been drinking for years, and uh, these drinks are very, very sweet. And obviously, health is not their main focus. So in these changing times, how are these companies able to adapt to these new changes? Yeah, this is also, I think many older brands are 
of thinking because they want to be younger. They want to yeah. win the younger customers. So a lot of older brands are also joining the competition with like young brands like Genki Forest. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the brands is uh, Nongfu Shanquan. So they have been in the market for like 20 or 30 years already. Mm -hmm. And they are, after seeing the, the success of Genki Forest, they also launched a very similar product. It's also a, a flavored sparkling water, very, very similar to Genki Forest sparkling water. So I guess this is one of their strategy launching new products, but actually it was not really as successful as Genki Forest because it's too similar and it's just under no Chanchan's spread name, but has you know, no difference from other sparkling water. And another try is uh, that I see uh, is from Wahaha. It's another very famous um, older Chinese beverage brand. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they co-brand with the young brand, the Wang Hong brand, uh, Zhong Xue Gao, an, an ice cream brand in China. So they co-brand with Zhong Xue Gao and launch uh, a flavored ice cream with their iconic AD milk flavor. So, so they have an iconic um, beverage uh, which is a milk called AD Gaina. So, so they launched this uh, co-branding ice cream, uh, uh, which is in the AD milk flavor, and the, they name it an underage ice cream because the AD milk has been a memory of our childhood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because we we drinking it, you know, during our primary school, and it's been like ten or twenty years already. So they launched this uh, underage ice cream bringing you back to your childhood. I think this is a, a very good strategy for older brands because they represent our um, memory and they bring this memory back and they co-brand with some um, some trending, some emerging brands now. I think this is a good try. Yeah, I think co-branding is definitely uh, one of the best ways to go for these older brands, you know, marketing to nostalgia. Because uh, as you mentioned, um, the uh, Nongfu Chanshun, brand not being able to compete with Genki Forest. I think that is because their brand, their uh, their old brand uh, name is a double-edged sword. On one hand, you might think that, oh, because they're such a famous brand, such an established brand, people might want to go to their product. But then on the other hand, their brand is already associated with old products and unhealthy products. So when you see a drink that has, uh, you know, Kang Shifu or Nongfu Shanshen on it, your brain immediately goes to, you know, there are unhealthy drinks of the yeah. past. And you feel like these drinks are so, these brands are so set in their old ways that they can't possibly be healthy. And then you see these newer brands, uh, such as uh, Cha Pai and uh, the Cha Pai drink, and also the, you know, Genki Forest. Um, since their conception, since their creation, all they've been marketing are these healthy drinks. So when you think of their brands, you immediately associate them with health. And I think that is a very big strength of these brands. Yeah, and also for some older brands, um, they they will try to launch some sub brands uh, under the same group. So they use different brands to target different people. The sub brands will be targeting the young consumers because it's actually new, just under the same group. And like you said, the the, the customers will immediately think of it as a healthy brand and don't relate it to um to the older brands, unhealthy brands. Mm. And. Uh... Uh, I think we can conclude our discussion here. So um, for the last thing we want to discuss, uh, where do you see the health, uh, uh, healthy uh, foods, healthy drinks, the industry, where do you see it going in China in the next few decades? Um, I think, um, like I said, this has been a trend um, for years. So I think people are looking for more and more healthy food. Um, currently, we see that the hottest concept is like zero sugar, zero fat. But in my opinion, I think maybe in future three to five years, you may see some um, low salt uh, products coming up. Because like we know, in China, the Chinese recipes, when we're cooking at home, we usually uh, adding a lot of salt uh, compared to Western recipes. So maybe um, in the future, we will start to re uh, realize um, we, do, we not only need the low sugar or uh, low carbohydrate products, but we also need low salt products. So this is yeah how I see maybe in the future. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, 
on a lot of uh, food delivery apps, you know, for example, Olamon, there are actually a lot of stores that sell specifically food for uh, people who do fitness or people who do bodybuilding. Um, mm -hmm. And on each uh, food or each ingredient, they list uh, specifically the amount of calories and uh, amount of uh, other other nutrients in the ingredient. And uh, they help the bodybuilder or help the person build a lunch or dinner that's very, very specific uh, tuned to yeah. his or her every need and I think yeah as the uh, as trends change you know the the younger generation and the younger demographic ages um, I think yeah like we'll be seeing a lot more of these healthy brands healthy drinks healthy foods and uh, I think there's a huge potential well obviously for growth for these brands in China yeah yeah I agree uh I think we can wrap this up now. Um, it's so great to have you. Um, so it's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for giving us so many useful insights. Thank you.